Is India today only a partly free democracy? Are we an elected autocracy? Is India heading towards fascism? These are the epithets that have been used in recent times by the Economist Intelligence Unit, by the Swedish-based think tank VDEM, by Freedom House, and India's democratic rankings in the Economist Intelligence Unit has slipped from 27 to 46. But how valid are these rankings? Is Indian democracy being exposed? Or is Indian democracy being unfairly demonized? Joining us now is someone who believes that India deserves better, that India has been unfairly demonized when it comes to democracy rankings. Professor Salvato Babonis is associate professor at the University of Sydney, uh, a comparative sociologist with a focus on quantitative cross-national research. And his paper questioning and challenging, or his articles challenging these democracy rankings have created quite a stir. So I'm going to ask you, Professor, to tell us why you believe that all these various rankings suggesting that India in the Modi years is a country where democracy is in recession are actually inaccurate, falsified, and are demonizing democracy in India. India gets a, a bum rap in the international rankings. Now, I know that because they provide What evidence. is a bum rap? A bum rap is an unfair deal. And I will say not so much India as Indians get an unfair deal in the ranking. After all, it's your democracy. The problem is that all three of these rankings organizations, in the evidence they provided to substantiate their rankings, um, that evidence is full of mendacity, it's full of errors, it's full of seemingly intentional misrepresentations, it's full of lapses of editorial oversight. In fact, almost to a number, not one of the bits of evidence adduced in support of the decline in India's democracy rankings since 2014 actually adds up. So we'll come to that evidence in a moment on the basis of which uh, you've suggested that the democracy rankings are unfair. But before that, let's set the record straight. Those who are supporters of Prime Minister Modi are saying, Salvatore Babones needs to be embraced by us. He, you know, he's saying what we've been saying for years. Critics of the Prime Minister are saying, who is this American-based professor in Australia who's never been to India to talk about India's democracy? You want to respond and set that record straight? And, and this is my first visit to India. Thank you very much. Uh, I am a comparative sociologist, so my work is on international rankings, not on India as such. I've become interested in India because when you look at India in international perspective, in a comparative perspective, India is by far the world's greatest democratic success story. And I say that unreservedly, because as a social scientist, if we study democracy, the first thing we see is that there are no poor democracies. There is no country with a GDP per capita of less than $10,000 per year that has a consistent record of democratic elections going back more than a few decades. India stands out as the enormous exception. It's no surprise that rich countries are democracies. All the rich countries are democracies. India is the only poor country that has a well-institutionalized democracy. It's the only post-colonial country to have remained a democracy throughout its entire history. And it's the only well-institutionalized democracy on the Eurasian continent between South Korea and Israel. That makes India a truly exceptional case that drove me to study it. That's interesting because uh, you, know, you cite the fact that the GDP or the per capita income of Uttar Pradesh uh, is very similar to that of Rwanda. And you ask us to contrast, look at democracy in Rwanda and look at it in Uttar Pradesh. So your basic thesis comes from the fact that a poor country, in your view, is one with, it's an exception, which India is an exception, a poor country, which is a rich democracy. 
Statistically, it stands out. And I am a sociologist. My background, though, is as a statistician. Uh, those of you who are engineers, I know engineers are very popular in India, will be surprised to learn. I have a Master of Science in Engineering from Johns Hopkins, but it's in applied math. <laughs> so I can't actually build something. Yes, we have to control for factors like wealth. Uh, we have communal, I've, I've read a lot about communal tensions in Uttar Pradesh. I've heard a lot about communal violence in Uttar Pradesh. Compare that to the communal violence in Rwanda or in a Burundi, countries that have similar levels of GDP per capita as Uttar Pradesh, and it's shocking. Compare Bihar to Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Congo is the heart of darkness. The, 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 it is the uh, archetype of the basket case of a failed state. Well, Bihar has problems. I've read about them. I've never been there. I'd love to learn more about it, but nothing on the scale of the problems in the Congo. And I think that's a testament to the success of India. Uh, let's then test the empirical evidence that sure. you have suggested uh, is the basis, uh, which you've in a way demolished or attempted to demolish the empirical evidence cited by these think tanks that have lowered India's democracy rankings. The Economist Intelligence Unit labels India as a flawed democracy characterized by a serious deterioration in the quality of democracy under leader Narendra Modi. Sweden's VDEM says that we are essentially moving towards an electoral autocracy on par with Russia, and Freedom House says we are only partially free with an overall freedom rank of tied 85th in the world. Now, one of the major reasons they cite for this is discrimination against minorities, and they use laws like CAA to suggest, or the abolition of Article 370 to suggest that minorities are under siege. How do you link that to the ranking system? So let's be clear, as in the last session, when we say minorities, people are really talking about Islam in India. We're okay. talking about Muslims. Primarily about Muslims in India. Muslims are severely underrepresented in Indian politics. They're probably severely underrepresented at this conference. Uh, how many Muslim speakers are at the conclave? Probably not 15%. Now, there are reasons for that. Uh, you don't have to have overt discrimination to see that sort of figure. Muslims in general are poorer than the rest of India. How many poor people are in the audience here? Very few. All right, so if there are lower levels of education, if there are lower levels of income, you would expect lower levels of accomplishment at the level of parliamentary seats. Now, I'm not excusing that. Okay, India should be working harder to be more inclusive for its minority populations, Muslims especially. But the rankings have pointed specifically to this number of a low level of Muslim representation, 5% of Lok Sabha is Muslim, yet the, per, the number of Muslims in the Lok Sabha has increased between 2014 and 2019. Now we can say it hasn't increased enough. It's a marginal increase. We are basically, well, in 20, interestingly in 2009, 5% of the Lok Sabha yeah was Muslim in 2019, it was also around 5%. Or we could say there's been a 23% increase in the number of Muslims in Lok Sabha. Look, either way you say it, it can't be used to justify a decline in the rankings between 2014 and 2019. It can be used to justify a low ranking. Mm -hmm. And if India's ranking had been consistently low on all three of these indices for the last 20 years, I wouldn't have written the paper. Let's therefore look uh, interestingly at one of the other factors that is cited for India's declining democracy quotient, sedition laws. Sure. And the belief that as many of these think tanks have suggested, sedition is being used to criminalize dissent and the number of sedition FIRs have increased between 2010 and 2020. Not necessarily 2014, but from 2010 to 2020. So I know this is very personal for you. I've read your Wikipedia page. But <laughs> it is. <laughs> but, but look, I, unfortunately, I, the Supreme Court as of now has struck down sedition <laughs> as of today. But, 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 but I have to go to the data, not to the personal cases. Now, when I as a statistician saw 2010 to 2020, and the text said during the decade 2010 to 2020, immediately it clicked in my head. You know, there are lies, damn lies in statistics. 2010 to 2020 is not a decade. 2010 to 2019 is a decade, or 2011 to 2020 is a decade. Why those end dates? So I went back to the original data. It turns out if you choose either of those other definitions of a decade, the number of FIRs filed for, for sedition has fallen. But if you choose specifically the two endpoints, 
2010 and 2010, 2010, 2020, they've risen because 2020, 2010 was a low date for sedition. 2020 was a big bump in the numbers, and so you can find a trend. Right. And they found a trend, and I think that's the problem. The fact that you can find a trend should not be driving impartial academic studies of democracy. If a journalist does that, I'll forgive you. But an academic organization, an independent think tank, should not be engaging in that sort of cherry picking. So what you're saying is the data was being cherry picked. Uh, there was an, the necessary element of academic skepticism which should accompany any such rankings was missing. Am I correct broadly? The, the skepticism is the, is the point here because the organizations doing the rankings picked that number from an activist NGO report. And they didn't say to themselves, should I take the activist NGO at their word or should I go and just look a little deeper into the numbers? They didn't ta exercise that editorial oversight. Let's therefore take a look at one of those other numbers they looked at, that the maximum number of journalists were arrested in India, next only to China, in the last one year. Again, that was used to again suggest that democracy in India and journalism in India is under threat. So, an another one that's personal. <laughs> Here, look, it wasn't journalists. No, I haven't gone to jail yet. I might. <laughs> well, good, go because it was actually journalists killed. So we don't that's want right, that at all. Killed. We don't want anyone killed. Uh, so the number of journalists killed is the largest number in a single country outside China which sounds dramatic, until you make the very elementary adjustment, what about per capita? So it turns out that in India, there were 3.5 journalists killed per billion people. That's 3.5 too many. In the rest of the world, there were 6.3 killed per billion people. In fact, it's safer to be a journalist in India, despite the fact, and I emphasize this again, that India is a relatively poor country. It's safer to be a journalist in India than in the rest of the world. I mean, on that same note, Press Freedom Index, not covered in my paper, Press Freedom Index now ranks India below Hong Kong. 2022, this is post security law, post the closing of Apple Daily, the abduction of its publisher, the demolishing of its printing presses. Press Freedom Index, published by Reporters Sans Frontiers, rates India below Hong Kong for press freedom. Now, you journalists in India tell me, are you more oppressed than journalists in Hong Kong? You know, I, I, I have always believed that journalists are relatively free in India compared to most parts of the world. When I find, for example, Indian academics going to Qatar or going to Middle Eastern countries and lamenting the fate of journalists in India, I wonder whether they are speaking to the wrong audiences. You know who I'm referring to. I do, and look, th that article was about uh, the accusation that India is a fascist state. And I, look, I encourage you, pick up your phone and do a quick Google search. Ask Google, is India a fascist country? Google will tell you yes. Look at it, do it right now. You'll find the far first 10 results telling you that India is a fascist country. That's something that should really concern you. That is a danger for India, whatever side you are in politics, whether you think that the current government is fascist or not, you make your own judgment. But that India is now being portrayed as a fascist country in the global media, and that if a, if a student who knows nothing more about India, if a legislator, if a parliamentarian, if a journalist overseas, who just has to do one article on India, they're not an expert on India, they have to pen off something, they have four hours to make 600 words on India, they Google, is India a fascist country? Google says yes. They click some links, now it's there. Now it's in the New York Times, now it's in the Washington Post. That is a problem for India and for Indians. I'll come to that problem in a moment, what that does to India but, and, and India's image and reputation. But Professor Babonis, the fact is much of this is perceptional. If I come across a case, as there have been cases in an Uttar Pradesh, where a journalist covering a midday meal scheme and exposing uh, the manner in which the midday meal scheme was run is immediately arrested or FIRs are filed or is charged with sedition, I will get a sense that there is something wrong with the Indian state. And that might, in a way, influence my article. I'm a journalist, not an academic. So a journalist will go by live examples. You're then doing data mining to suggest, no, no, all is well, or it isn't as bad as you're making it out to be. So is part of the problem the fact that maybe from an external perspective, you're looking at data. I live in India. 
and I'm actually looking internally at what journalists on the ground at times have to go through in different parts of the country to report fairly and honestly. Maybe I expect a higher standard of freedom than what you perhaps look at purely from a data perspective. Look, I, I want to be clear. I'm not faulting journalists. I'm not faulting activist NGOs for doing their job. I mean, forgive me, the dharma of an activist NGO is to criticize. That's what they do. That's what their reason for being is. I'm not criticizing individual citizens for what they believe about their own country. I'm criticizing fellow academics, fellow academics who are being, I, I think I can actually say mendacious in their evaluations of India because I went through every bit of evidence adduced and at every point there was cherry picking, misrepresentation, failure to exercise editorial oversight. There was hardly anything in the three reports that would stand up to scrutiny. Are you therefore suggesting that these institutes, most of them based in the Western world, are in a way prejudiced because they allow their ideological biases to influence their better judgment? Are you suggesting that there is this left liberal monopoly in a way over many of these institutes that judge India through the prism of the fact that Narendra Modi, a right-wing nationalist populist leader, is leading India and thereby tend to, in a way, look at India through the prism of Mr. Modi as the Prime Minister of India? In, in a word, no. Uh, the in, problem, a word, no. in a word, no. The, the, these are not biased organizations that are out to get India. They evaluate democracy in 150 plus countries. Most of the people involved have no particular interest in India. The problem is that all of these rankings are based on surveys. So each of them has the same methodology. They do a survey of intellectuals, journalists, academics who either are based in the country they're studying or who are students of the country from outside. Prominent academics and journalists who cover, in India's case, India. Maybe people at Harvard, maybe people at JNU, it may be people in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. They survey them and they ask them for, to report back on the country. It's those reports that are biased. Now, at the level of the organization, there's a lack of editorial oversight. I don't excuse that, but I do understand it. If you're exercising editorial oversight about narratives for 150, 170 countries, that's a lot of oversight to exercise. It's a lot of hard work. But fundamentally, these biases don't creep in because the organizations are anti-India. They creep in because, forgive me, India's intellectual class is anti-India. As a class, not as individuals, no, 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 no. India's class. intellectual class is anti-India or are you saying that they are anti-Mr. Modi and are conflating the two? Or there's are you a, conflating the two? There, there is a bit of both. They're certainly anti-BJP, anti-Mr. Modi as a class, not every individual. But imagine that in a couple years you get a uh, UPA government. Mm -hmm. okay. Will they... Mm, tear down the Ram Mandir? Will they reverse the policies, the very policies that are criticized in these rankings? Will they get rid of the UAPA? Right. So the basis on which the criticisms are made, those bases will probably remain in place. If they do, then the same criticisms will apply to them. No, but aren't those intellectuals or activists supposed to stand up to the Indian state where let's say an individual activist is arrested for his ideological beliefs and denied bail under UAPA, like an Omar Khalid, for example, uh, an activist in the CA agitation, when there are hundreds of Kashmiris who were put in jail once Article 370 was removed? I mean, are these not questions that Indians are entitled, when you yeah. turn around and say intellectuals and activists are being anti-India, maybe they are standing for the few spaces that are available to question the government of the day. And that's what is, in my view, India's greatness, that we still allow it to happen unlike a China or a Hong Kong. Why not celebrate it rather than suggest this is being anti-India? Actually, patriotism, as, de as separate from nationalism perhaps, is actually questioning your government. So the very intellectuals that in a way you're demonizing are actually the intellectuals we should be celebrating because unlike others, they're at least raising a few red flags. Yeah. The issue is, is this tied 
to the BJP government, or will it continue when that government inevitably, I know people think the BJP will last forever, it won't last forever, there will be a change of power at some point. When that change of power occurs, will there be a recalibration in people's opinions, or will the demands placed on Congress and the U UPA be unrealistic? Will those demands not be fulfilled by that government either? And the question is, is, I mean, is India a fascist country today? And, and you know, if you want to raise your hands, I, I think that's, an, that's really an outrageous proposition. India has problems. Certainly journalists and activists have a, absolutely a role to play in calling out those problems. The problem isn't that these journalists may be opposed to the government of the day. The problem isn't that the activists uncover sordid details of law enforcement. The problem is that they allow that to color their overall evaluation of the system. So in a way, what you're suggesting is that in this era of increasingly polarized politics, it's becoming more and more difficult to have objective rankings on democracy. Am I correct? Um, maybe. Uh, uh, that's a, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe you're correct. Look, uh, what I'm suggesting is that people who may have been motivated to criticize Indian democracy because they don't like the outcome that democracy has resulted in, are sliding bit by bit towards, instead of criticizing the party they don't like, to criticizing the state they don't like. And that becomes a threat for India. That's the point at which India, in the future, may face sanctions of the kind that Israel has long been under. Uh, you know, India, India, I mean, why, does India, why is India so close to Russia? One reason is that India needs that Russian veto on the Security Council. Otherwise, India will be cast in the United Nations as a fascist state. Right? The activism won't stop at India's doors. The, activism, the, the demonization of India will continue in the international arena. And that's really what you should be worrying about. It's interesting you're saying this in a week where your country... The United States goes to the polls where the U.S. President Joe Biden goes to the people of the United States this week and says democracy is on the future of democracy is on the ticket. On the ballot. It's Absolutely. on the ballot. The future of democracy is on the ballot. Almost as if to suggest that if you vote Republican yeah. in the United States, you're being anti-democratic. So it's not as if India is the only country which faces people. Yeah. Your own U.S. President today is suggesting that those who don't vote for the Democrats are anti-democratic. A few weeks ago, Joe Biden called 70 million Americans ultra-MAGA extremists and suggested that they were a form of terrorists. Um, yet all of you read the U.S. news. Many of you probably have New York Times or Wall Street Journal subscriptions. You're, you're very aware of what's happening in the U.S. All journalists, all parliamentarians in India can name the U.S. president probably the U.S. Vice, well, in India, certainly the U.S. Vice President. Uh, you may be able to name the Speaker of the House. You probably know 40 or 45 U.S. states. You've visited the U.S. You have relatives in the U.S. You can form your own judgment, regardless of what Joe Biden says. The problem for India is the same is not true of American journalists, of American parliamentarians. If, I mean, I had the head of a think tank in Australia warn me about my India research, sending me a column in the Washington Post saying that you know, India is a fascist country and saying, well, should I be writing this kind of work? If, you know, am I really making a mistake here? And I, said, I rolled my eyes and I said, no, that's Rana Ayub. She writes that every month in the Washington Post. You shouldn't. But he doesn't read every column she writes. For him, this was a Washington Post columnist saying it right? because that's the only data point a typical leader has. I mean, I heard in person a former national security advisor of the United States tell a story about a military coup in India during the Johnson administration. Now, there's never been a military coup in India. If he meant the emergency, that wasn't during the Johnson administration. Yet this profound misunderstanding reaches into the Oval Office. Most of you know more about the United States than the national security advisor of the United States knows about India. And that's the problem. So are you suggesting to me that this stems primarily out of ignorance or out of malice? And taken that forward, are you suggesting that so-called venerable newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times are part of some kind of a sinister conspiracy possibly or pure ignorance when it comes to India? 
mostly it's ignorance. But it's ignorance compounded by goodwill. Many of the worst things are done by people who mean well. So you have a young Indian journalist, new graduate, Columbia Journalism School, who's very passionate about his or her home country, wants to write articles about it, just an intern maybe at the New York Times. Well, you give that person the, the chance. Oh, you yeah, write an article. Their article gets 800,000 hits. That, that journalist is a, that's a win, right? Let's get another article from that young budding journalist. So what you have is editors who maybe don't know very much. They take the word. If you have a young, earnest, idealistic new journalist, you take that journalist's word. This is what happened at VDEM. VDEM's ranking of Indian democracy collapsed when, and I don't know the person personally, I don't know her background, I don't want to give the name, but when a young Indian research assistant was brought in to author the India report at VDEM. So it went from being authored collectively by VDEM to they did a special report in India in which the co-author was a young Indian intern. Suddenly India's democracy rankings collapsed. So what you're calling for is a much more serious academic audit of these reports. Broadly, that's what you're suggesting. Hopefully free of ideological biases, focus purely on data. Because we've now got a new controversy, not just democracy, we've also had the hunger index. So let and, me, let and me the tell you about the hunger index. The hunger index puts us at about 105. So let me, let me tell you about the hunger index. I, I, the, the government issued a rebuttal and it was very, forgive me government, uh, very unscientific. They said a survey of 3,000 people can't represent all of India. You know, as a survey researcher, a survey of 3,000 is fantastic. The, the standard errors are tiny for that. That's not the problem. It took me about 20 minutes to find the problem. The problem was there was a comparison made between 2014 and 2021 uh, in, in, in the uh, in, in global, 2014 and 2022 in the GHI. The 2014 GHI was released before the 2014 data for India came out and before the election in 2014. The government provided an estimate for uh, for the levels of wasting that was extremely low. They said there's been massive progress on wasting, it's very low. Now, I don't know if they did that as an honest mistake or if they did that to improve their position in the rankings ahead of an election. Either way, the 2014 estimate showed India doing much better than we turned out than it actually was. In 2015, the real data came out and in fact, wasting in India had only declined a tiny bit. Okay. So in 2014, incredible improvement global hunger index. 2022, new data are used and it shows, oh, India's regressed. Now I said, it's, that's impossible. India's economy has grown 50% since 2014. It is inconceivable that hunger has increased in India since 2014. There may still be hunger, can't have increased. I went back to the report, I found the data, I found that wrong data point. The problem with the current report was not that the current report is wrong, the current report is accurate. It uses accurate, up-to-date Government of India data. All the data come from Government of India. The problem is they never corrected that 2014 false low for hunger. And so it looked like hunger had increased. So, okay. so net, net, Professor, what's the solution? What would, you, what would give you possibly greater confidence that when these democracy rankings come out in the future or hunger rankings come out in the future, that these are objectively being analyzed? Because the institutes are going to remain the same. Uh, do you really believe that a solid academic audit now is possible, would that, how would you go about it if, if someone offered you the opportunity to go about it? Uh, you don't have to offer me the opportunity, you have to offer me five million dollars to start a think tank to do the work. Uh, no, the, the, the problem is that this, I keep saying the problem is because the problems are, they're right there, this can't easily be solved. It, it can't easily be solved because the academic, the global academic world does not care to solve it. I mean, the solution isn't a rebuttal by the government of India. The government of India is biased. Of course it's biased. It's pro-India. Okay. We're not going to get this solved unless academics have the fortitude to review their own work and to be honest and criticize their own work. And self-criticism is very rare these days. In conclusion, ever since you sort of debunked these, these rankings, has the government of India approached you, uh, Professor Babanis, that why don't you become a consultant? The Modi government <laughs> would like the world to know that l India is not a fascist state, that India is not slipping in on the democracy index. 
you'd be extremely valued. Has uh, the government approached you? Anyone uh, sort of offered you a consultancy? I, I, I'd be thrilled. Uh, but so tomorrow I'm, I'm traveling to Delhi to visit friends in Delhi. And while I'm there, I'm going to be speaking at the SP Mukherjee Foundation uh, Research Foundation, the, the think tank arm of the BJP. They didn't even offer to pay for my hotel. Now, <laughs> it's my own flight, it's my own hotel. India Today brought me to India. Uh, they may applaud what I'm doing, but uh, no. <laughs> I've but not gotten you, any I, money for but, it. But, but aren't you then worried as an academic that you will be now labeled, branded as someone who's a Modi Bhakt? In case sure. you, you need a translation for Bhakt, it means a devotee. That you sure. become a devotee of the Modi government, and therefore, here is Professor Babanos. He's the person we've been looking for. Uh, look, that, that's always a risk. I was very careful not to accept any invitations until I got one to India from a very highly reputable journalistic organization, India Today. I did get offers to come to India to speak. I don't know who from. They were a bit mysterious, uh, but I turned them down. This invitation I accepted because I was confident that here we could talk without any hint uh, that there was anything untoward involved. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you very much for accepting it and in a way giving us your perspective and the very fact that we have a platform like this here in India is a platform that we are unlikely to see ever in a Beijing or a Shanghai or a Hong Kong or there I say most of the countries, some of the countries that are actually being ranked above India on the democracy ranking at the moment. So I guess that in itself is testament to the fact that these rankings need closer interrogation. And I think that's what is the challenge of our times, that don't go by rankings purely by the headline that they offer, but you need a closer audit of just how those rankings are being made. Professor Babanus, thank you very much for joining us and enjoy your visit to Delhi. Thank you. Now that you've announced it here, who knows uh, what other invitations may be on your way <laughs> while you're there. But thank you very much. You'll be called an anti-national by one side and uh, the other side might believe that you've sold out. But thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Dinesh Bhatia, could I please request you to come up on stage and uh, offer a token of our appreciation to Salvatore. His books are available at the Author's Corner, everybody right outside at the opposite the All Day Conclave Cafe. <laughs>